LinkedIn. My name is Nisi Solman and I am a senior research associate at CPPR and I'll be the host for the day. Um, so in continuation to our earlier discussion, uh, the focus of today's webinar uh, will be on the higher education space um, in India uh, and to be in the context of NEP. Uh, we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Shakila Shamchu. She was formerly OST of uh, New Education Policy in the Department of Higher Education at the Ministry of Education. She has played an instrumental role in drafting national education policy um, in her capacity as uh, secretary to the committee. Uh, she was also a nodal officer of the flagship Government of India scheme of uh, national mission on teachers and teaching. A core area covers education planning and policy making, uh, teacher education, ICT, open and distance learning and inclusive education. She is also a special advisor on education policy at CPPR. We welcome you, ma'am. In conversation, we also have Dr. D. Dhanuraj. Uh, he is a chairperson of uh, Board of Trustees and the chief executive of CPPR, of which he is also one of the founding members. He has extensively worked in the field of education, livelihood, and urbanization, and he has co-authored the ebook on a uh, vision for higher education reform and a paper on understanding the status of in, uh, Indian higher education, challenges and skepticism towards uh, serious investments in the sector. Uh, before we start with the uh, session, I would like to state some ground rules. The virtual uh, floor will be open to questions at all times and you may type in your questions in your chat box. The moderator will address the questions to the speaker during uh, uh, during the event. And those joining from FP can put your questions there and our team will direct uh, the questions to the speakers and moderator. You can follow our live tweets and share your thoughts using hashtag education dialogue. And in case your friends could not join uh, the, the webinar, do let them know that we are live streaming the session on uh, Facebook so they can come and uh, look at uh, uh, the event details. Um, yeah. and. Uh, at all times, we would also request all the participants to keep themselves muted unless you have um, uh, a point to contribute. Uh, thank you very much. And I now hand it over to Dr. Panaraj. Uh, thank you, Nisi. Uh, thank you, Nisi, for uh, the introduction uh, for today's uh, uh, webinar on uh, national education policy, uh, which we are going to focus on. Uh, today, we are going to focus on higher education sector. Um, earlier, we had uh, we, we hosted an extensive discussion on school education, how national education policy is trying to bring a change uh, the way school education uh, systems and organization, how they are going to reconfigure the entire system and their processes. Uh, today, we are going to focus on higher education. And uh, uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to interact with you and also uh, to hear from you uh, the various challenges and also various uh, debates that we come across these days on national education policy uh, and get some clarifications and also give, get some insights on uh, national education policy with respect to, especially in uh, higher education sector uh, uh, in today's webinar. Uh, Ma'am, uh, before I start, uh, I would like you to give a brief on um, uh, higher education and national education policy, how the committee has uh, tried to address national education policy. Uh, 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 the, I mean, try to address higher education um, uh, you, by national education policy. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Danuraj, and uh, thank you to the CPPR team and all who are attending the webinar today. Um, as far as the committee to draft the NEP was concerned, both as far as school education or higher and professional, including technical uh, teacher education and vocational education and so on. So I, as I was saying, we have been actually seized about the ground realities uh, that had affected, uh, that affects the higher education sector, particularly uh, the, all the verticals within the sector as such. And in particular, we were very concerned in higher education about the fact that our youth are not having the kind of uh, relevant jobs related to their area of education. And there are a lot of in imbalances in the quality of education across the institutions. And the fact that uh, as a country, we are committed to the sustainable development goals, 
that the uh, embedding of the odl education and vocational education has been quite limited and uh, if we keep uh, having this approach it is quite possible that uh, you would not be able to actually mainstream uh, these within the higher education uh, sector and also because of the technological changes uh, that were taking place uh, particularly with the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on we were actually feeling that the silo based education that we are offering uh, might possibly be uh, out of sync with what the global scenario is so uh, basically the uh, approach uh, by looking at the reforms in higher education is how to increase the competitive edge of our students in higher education and the higher education institutions uh, uh, in the at the institutional level also and if that had to take place if we were to be sort of having relevant uh, education for our youngsters then we need to have a transformation and therefore uh, the chairman often uses a word that the policy the nep 2020 is not an incremental reform it is a transformative reform it se it seeks to transform the institutions the academic uh, curricula the pedagogical approaches the regulatory systems uh, and particularly on governance the committee as uh, i mean unanimously the committee had felt that there had to be a lot of re regulatory reforms that is necessary because one that we found that it was very stifling we found that it was uh, an over concentration of uh, up powers within um, regulatory bodies and because of that over concentration with all due respect to ugc and aicte and the national council for teacher education they have been sort of not capable of handling regulation and funding and accreditation and standard setting which all seem to be sort of amorphously becoming uh, too unwieldy for them to manage so while making the while formulating the policy uh, certain things remained I, i mean one thing that we need to understand while we held two different webinars for school and higher the chapter 1 of the nep 2020 basically outlines certain common underlying principles uh, which we be begins with this idea that every child is unique has certain unique potentials and therefore we need to nurture that unique potential and uh, accordingly it is in tune with that that we have made a whole lot of reforms towards the holistic multidisciplinary education and i may mention here that the draft nep 2019 used a very commonly accepted terminology in globally that is liberal arts education but uh, in indian context the liberal arts education the spirit of the liberal arts education was not seemingly understood by a lot of stakeholders and therefore there was a feeling that we were going to sideline stem subjects altogether and go into only focusing on social sciences and humanities and so on and therefore we came about with this more uh, commonly acceptable terminology of holistic multidisciplinary education we also in the higher education talked about the multiplicity of institutions it is good to say we are a very large higher education system and that uh, uh, we have 1000 universities and 40000 colleges 30000 stand alone institutions the statistics are you know quite uh, alarm uh, quite uh, satisfying in a certain sense in terms of quantitative numbers but what is distressing is to note that these are at various various levels of quality and these are governed by different set of rules and called by a complexity of terminologies of central universities iits nits which are institutions of national importance then you have the state universities affiliating universities unitary universities private universities deemed university so that entire complexity we thought there is a need for a kind of a rationalization then comes the concern in terms of the two major stakeholders of the students and the teachers and what kind of ecosystems have to be provided so that they can be optimally uh, sort of engaged 
and also allow for optimization of their talents and their potentials so a whole lot of recommendations on how to create the optimal learning environments for students and at the same time have energized motivated and capable faculty the issues relating to equity and inclusion and the nomenclature of the socially and economically disadvantaged groups is a new area because 86 policy had separate sub subsections for scs sts women minorities uh, differently abled and so on here we have gone and created a sort of a genus of saying trying to say that all these categories would belong to the socially and economically disadvantaged groups at at the same time the policy looks at seeing the public and the private institutions not in a state of conflict recognizing the role of the private sector both in school and in higher education and saying that if they need to be leveraged and they need to contribute then a level playing field has to be provided and while at the same time emphasizing and underscoring the fact that education is a public good and cannot be commercialized and cannot therefore become a profit making enterprise but at the same time we wanted that internal governance systems must be a combination of greater autonomy of higher education institutions with a uh, equal balancing of accountability in fact the five pillars of the nep 2020 of access equity quality affordability and accountability it is very very critical that you hold internal you create internal systems of checks and balances and hold all those who are responsible being accountable for the tasks and for the responsibilities that they have so robust board, board of governors that we are talking about the whole lot of reforms in the regulatory structure and the idea of promoting internationalization encouraging odl and vocational education transforming the teacher education sector and finally the cross cutting themes of technology in education and of course research the idea of hes hies being both teaching intensive and research intensive institutions and that teaching and research cannot remain in watertight compartments but they need to be amalgamated to promote entrepreneurship to promote greater research productivity in terms of publications and patents and that therefore a new body that the national research foundation will act as a catalytic body to promote research bring about a collaborative uh, platform for hies and industry so industry and uh, research laboratories coming together so in he in higher education we have touched upon uh, in fact the focus in the policy uh, while making about a lot of changes in school education where, uh, and where actually school education might seem to be uh, very very cohesively um, uh, knitted together the higher education requires parallel sets of reforms to take place uh, both at the institutional level at the students level at the teachers level and in the policy frameworks towards using technology and uh, allowing for that entire changes that we are looking at in the regulatory structure so i think i leave it at this and uh, you know, take the questions rather than having a monologue that may be able to clarify many of the queries that have come in from the participants and uh, what the cppr team may have put together also thank you thank you ma'am uh, uh, that's a good beginning for our uh, conversation uh, whenever we talk about whenever we discuss higher education in the country uh, uh, the most common refrain is all about ugc university grants commission uh, uh, ugc is there everywhere uh, and uh, same, same is the case with the many other higher education uh, high, uh, regulators regulatory bodies in higher education sector acp uh, national teachers uh, training is to uh, regulatory bodies and all so the policy in fact talks about a higher education commission uh, to regulate to oversee uh, the sector uh, could you give some insights how uh, what are the changes uh, we uh, the committee has envisioned uh, while proposing national uh, higher education commission and what would be the role or post the formation of national higher education commission what would be the role of ugcs and other regulatory bodies or are they going to 
continue with in a, in a with a different mandate or all all these bodies are going to be part of the commission Um, so, Dr. Dhanuraj, actually, uh, the uh, reform in the regulatory system has been envisioned right uh, from National Knowledge Commission onwards. At that time, it was called as the uh, Indian Regulatory yeah. Authority for yeah. Higher Education (IRAE), and then when we had uh, the UPA, it came out as the National Commission for Higher Education and Research (NCHER). then we had uh, a committee uh, headed by mk ko which looked into the reforms and there they had suggested a higher education um, uh, enrichment research authority um, uh, and that was hira then we dropped one of the e's and then we said it should be only a higher education regulatory authority it became hera finally at the time when we were doing the nep 2020 we had taken on board the existing efforts at trying to transform the regulatory system like you said very correctly the ugc the aict seem to be omnipresent in all areas of regulating higher education and uh, the um, the ugc when it was created in 1956 by an act of the parliament uh, it was only supposed to be a funding body and at that time the sector itself was so uh limited in uh, in its size it was not an a very unwieldy uh, sector but gradually over a period of time the ugc and the ict they not only were grant giving bodies but they also became the regulators taking action against those who did not fall in line they were the ones who were doing the accreditation through bodies like the nac and the nba and they were also the academic standard setting bodies because they laid down the broad curricular frameworks and so on now the nep 2020 had one principle and that was a light but tight regulatory system at the same time that this light but tight regulatory system would ensure that public and private institutions would be governed by the same set of norms and standards so we thought of having four independent verticals and that the that was only the separation of powers separating the four functions as a part of administrative prudence of regulation academic standard setting funding and accreditation this four functions when performed by four independent bodies would allow for greater effectiveness in the discharge of that role or the tasks that they are expected to carry out at the same time not res- result in mutually conflicting powers being vis- residing in the same body that is what led the committee to say that the, it should be done by four independent verticals now in the draft nep we had not visualized that if these four bodies were having issues of coordination and there were conflicts that were taking place who would be that body which would take care of issues to resolve that kind of intervening conflicts that may happen and it is when we were formulating the nep 2020 based on feedback that came from government of india ministries and higher education institutions as uh, for the benefit of the those who are attending today after the draft nep 2019 was uploaded on the website of the ministry on 1st june 2019 till the date that the the activity of actually formulating the nep 2020 started we had received as many as about 2 lakh suggestions and one of those suggestions looked at this particular uh, inadequacy if i may say so in the draft nep that if you create four independent verticals and you are silent about which is the body because in the draft nep we have visualized a body which never came into being in the nep 2020 and that is the rashtriya shiksha aayog which would be headed by the honorable prime minister and which would be like a standing body which is a collegiate body of the center and the states taken together being education being a concurrent list and that was not something that was uh, seen as a very palatable recommendation so while dropping the idea of a rashtriya shiksha aayog or a national education commission and saying that there would be four independent verticals that gap was sought to be filled in 
by a new architecture that we called as the higher education commission of india now when the hci which is supposed to be a legislative exercise it will be introduced in the parliament as a bill which has to then become an act when that comes into effect the ugc the aict the national council for teacher education and leaving out the bar council of india and the medical council of india totally we have 17 professional councils which handle different areas architecture pharmacy um, agriculture um, nursing and so on leaving out mci which deals with the medical education and leaving out the bar council all other bodies that is the ugc the ict the nct the um, uh, the council of architecture all of them will concede their regulatory powers within this new architecture and they themselves will become nullified and their acts becoming nullified they will become they would be rendered null and void they would no longer be existing at all now the role of the, uh, the this new structure that we have the ugc and aict and all these um, professional councils concede their regulatory powers to the vertical looking after regulation that is the national higher education Le regulatory council nherc now within the ugc you have bodies like nac which takes care of the assessment and accreditation whereas we have said that we will have a new structure that is the national assessment council which will be a national accreditation council which will be a super accreditor which will subsume nac which will subsume nba and which will also have a lot of other multiple accrediting agencies both governmental or even private that can be created for accrediting all the higher education institutions within the country the third vertical is going to be the funding part of it so since the ugc's regulatory powers has gone to nherc and it is no longer the funding body the funding activity will be taken over by a new body that we create that is the higher education grants commission and this will take care of funding not just for the general institutions but for technical institutions because all these institutions the idea of current structure of you know regular universities and technical institutions and so on all this goes away because we are talking all of them will become holistic multidisciplinary institution so the hegc will be responsible for doing the funding of the entire higher education system the last function which the ugc and the aict and others were doing is setting down the academic standards for the courses that are being offered and now since we are moving away from the silo based education and you have courses in a combination that would be allowed we have said that even so you will have professional standard setting bodies which can lay down the academic standards of an academic course that is being offered within that vertical of architecture or engineering or law or whatever and because you would have a sizable number of courses which are not within the ambit of the professional standard setting bodies such as nct for example that is no longer there there will be one that would take care for teacher education what about art science and commerce and so on there would be one that would be called the general education council so general education council with the composition of the professional standard setting bodies will take care of the function of laying down the academic standards and also prescribing what we may say that if that particular academic course would have certain standards to be acquired for following a profession that it has to follow then that standards could also be laid down but again in that aspect we would not be really able to prescribe all the professional standards it will only be rather confining itself to the academic standards because the professional standards will have to be actually taken care of by those professional councils which will concede their you know their regulatory powers but will continue to remain as professional standard setting bodies laying down both the academic standards and the professional standards so if you are studying let us say for example agriculture and you or you are studying architecture then 
the kind to become an architect what are those norms and standards that you'll have to do when you are getting a professional license to become an architect that will have to be prescribed by that professional council professional standard setting body so the hci is an umbrella architecture once that bill has become an act then no ugc there will be no existence of ugc or aict or nct or any other regulatory bodies that we see except as i said the medical council of india because we have a new legislation that was brought out last year that is in last year meaning the year before that in 2019 and the bar council of india other than that all the bodies would become a part and parcel of the higher education commission of india thank you ma'am uh, that was very useful uh, because uh, i uh, this is this has been a discussion uh, in many of this education circles for some time uh, what are the changes uh, we could see uh, once uh, the, the national uh, regulatory commission uh, comes into picture and what is going to happen with other uh, regulatory institutions that are existing now i am going to take you to another subject that is also commonly discussed uh, uh, this is about the graduation degree certificate certification a uh, famous or infamous attempt by delhi university and now the the, the this uh, policy talks about uh, options given to the students you now students can exit after one year with a certificate after two years with a diploma after three years with a degree bachelor certificate uh, could you could you explain um, uh, what are the changes and also in the context of these controversies and uh, i mean um, i remember a lot of discussion was happening at the national level when delhi university tried to do i mean attempted to do a similar uh, course restructuring few years back uh, even though now people say that you know it was a great attempt <laughs> we didn't realize it uh, could you give some insights to these uh, suggestions on graduation course uh, uh, dr dhanuraj firstly let me place on floor that uh, education is a subject not just that it is a part of the concurrent list but the process in which you bring about reform is very very important rather than the reform itself and therefore taking on board the consensus of all those who are going to make that reform becomes very very critical or again you cannot have a reform that is confined in a given specific university and which is not there across nationally you would create a a kind of a really a catastrophe because students would who are migrating in india we have the freedom of movement and we are not saying that you confine yourself to the jurisdiction of a state alone to undergo an undergraduate program so you have the theory of migration where you migrate from one university having completed some years of study and go on to the other so even in the nep 2020 the idea of flexibility which i said as i said it is a core principle that is there or a cardinal principle that's there in our chapter 1 and which is also being reflected in the school education where we are doing away with the hard separations of uh, curricular co curricular and extra curricular and actually building it is inbuilt from the class 6 onwards which is the middle stage in the new architecture of the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 that is from class 6 onwards where students will be making choices we are bringing in this flexibility to do away with discipline specific learning and do away with this idea that there is something that students will learn only arts or only science or only uh, commerce subjects or only vocational subject or only performing arts or only sports and so on amalgamate all of it have an integrated approach because knowledge itself has become very integrated and cross disciplinary or multidisciplinary that idea is carried forward into the higher education into this whole thing of the holistic multidisciplinary four year undergraduate program what is this we are actually saying that a student can if today you are offering a degree in arts or science or commerce or pharmacy or management or agriculture or law or engineering or technology or medicine or we walk or sports and music and so on these disciplinary boundaries will totally be vanishing 
when we allow a student to choose at the undergraduate level combination of subjects some could be in social sciences some in pure sciences some in vocational education so let me put it with subjects somebody takes let us say sociology or history learns hindi or english or any language learns mechanical engineering learns music learns a sport learns a vocational subject of carpentry this combination is not seen as not possible at all that means what today we are talking that students if they are doing will take up only art subjects or pure sciences subject or applied sciences subject that kind of rigidities in the curricular offerings will be removed and a student will be allowed to take up cross offerings in any combination that suits his or her aptitude and where he or she feels that my capability is in doing these multiple courses why did we think of this one is the individual is blessed with multiple intelligences multiple intelligences across the domains of knowledge skills and capabilities second the kind of changes that are taking place because of technology if we equip our young graduates with only discipline specific knowledge and that discipline itself becomes irrelevant in the context of the technological changes or the economic changes that happen then you are actually gearing up a student to remain unemployed or unproductive in the coming years the third is that in globally we have moved towards multidisciplinary interdisciplinary cross disciplinary and transdisciplinary education because the nature of knowledge itself we have said professor yashpal has said that at the beginning it is a porous thing it is not something that is a concrete block it is porous and therefore there is an assimilation of different disciplines into one discipline itself if you see the porosity of knowledge and therefore the impacting of one discipline onto another it is essential that india which has which is blessed with the youngest youth population in the world actually equip the students with the right kind of knowledge skills and capabilities embedding not just knowledge based or application based information but also what we call the 21st century skills of cognitive learning of critical thinking of uh, communication skills collaborative learning and so on so the whole idea of currently discipline specific institutions or discipline specific undergraduate program will actually melt away because we are allowing for this kind of course offering a very valid question that might come at this stage is how many institutions higher education institutions in india today can afford to offer that kind of multidisciplinary combination of courses we are very much seized of the fact that the ground reality is there are very very limited institutions which offer sing multidisciplinary education that is why we have said in the policy until all these institutions can move to become multidisciplinary by adding more departments or strengthening existing departments we can have a concept of what we call higher education clusters hei clusters can be a group of institutions within a geographical vicinity coming together to allow a student to take the flexible combination of courses and since we are sitting here right in cochin let us say for example somebody does a course from maharaja's college then wants to do a course in social work which is not offered in maharaja's does it from rajagiri or takes up a course in engineering and therefore does it from an engineering college and all this is possible because we are talking about two major things coming about a national higher education qualifications framework which will which will lay down the equivalence of the courses that are being conducted and the student as far as the student is concerned it is a customized academic bank of credit 
so in a class of let us say 30 students pursuing a undergraduate program in a given institution those 30 students grade card or grade sheet will look unique because that student has taken multiple courses from different institutions based on an uh, based on an mou that hei institutions enter into and as i said public and private are treated on par therefore it is not that there will be only government or government aided but that could also include purely private institutions which will be a part of the hei cluster and the flexibility goes on further to say that if a course is not available in face to face mode but it is available through an open university or through a distance education mode or as a moocs then the student can even pursue that course through the odl or through the moocs so the flexibility in the combination of courses multiple institutions mode of learning which could be purely which could be a combination of face to face plus odl plus moocs and any of these combinations is good enough now comes the flexibility in the entry and the exit as a signatory to the sdg goals and the fact that knowledge itself is dynamic and that one has to keep upgrading the knowledge and that as a student an adult student of 18 years who is given the right to vote and therefore should be given the credence of having intelligence to be quite focused might decide to join the first year with multiple choice of courses and complete that but does not continue his graduation immediately decides to take a break whether he is experimenting for starting a startup whether he is taking a break or a sabbatical because he has some health issues or whether he wants to pursue some vocation we are not wanting to look into that at all we think it is perfectly noble for an 18 year old having done the first year of education or the second year of education to take a break but the student is not treated as a dropout or a failure let me clarify here because nep 2020 was approved by the union cabinet on 29th of july 2020 this new architecture of the undergraduate program does not become effective from that date until the rules and regulations relating the roll out of the four year program on a uniform date across higher education institutions within the country as a whole are notified it could be 2022 23 academic year or it could be further than that but i don't anticipate it being built before that but if because we have to have the nheqf we have to have the academic bank of credit we have to have the state governments and the heis coming on board to decide when they can actually move into this idea of a four year program three year or four year program forming hei clusters allowing for the credit transfers between institutions and all that all that we are saying is that every year this uh, and also how much time will you allow for the student to come back suppose you are launching it from the 2022 to 23 academic year can we keep it for 10 years can we allow a student to come back in 2033 or is it possible for an institution to keep a record like that no then we will think of maybe 6 years or 8 years these are modalities that are that is work in progress and that will again be tasked to some task force which will have to look at all the institutions around this country and then arrive at a, you see the preparedness of institutions the preparedness of the states are at different levels but the roll out will have to be on a uniform date and once it is rolled out you cannot penalize a student who is doing it from university of kerala and wanting to continue let us say in jnu or going to mumbai university or any other place it should be the same architecture which allows the student to move in seamlessly into the second year or the third year the second important thing that we should understand over here is that the first year you get a certificate second year you get a diploma third year you can major in one subject and have a minor in another subject if you do that you get a bachelor's degree which is like a general bachelor's degree but if the student wishes to take on the fourth year 
and he would treat me he would be treated as a graduate completed if third year is complete it's not that he would be treated that you must come back and do the fourth year the student can decide to exit all together at third year that exit option is uh, is not there at the first year or second year he will only have a certificate or only have a diploma the person doing a third year will definitely get a bachelor's degree only we will not call it a bachelor's in multidisciplinary education we will we will still call it multidisciplinary but in bracket we will say major in let us say economics and minor of let's say psychology or mechanical engineering or whatever one course that the student has taken depending upon the credits that the student has acquired but suppose the student is going on to the fourth year and deciding to do two major subjects then that would be a bachelor's in multidisciplinary education majoring with two subjects in bracket that we may put it it could be journalism or media studies and it could be um, let us say community medicine or it could be geriatrics or it could be any combination or music and company whatever so two majors so in the fourth year if the student decides i would do one major and i would take up a major research project and submit a dissertation then that would be a bachelor's in multidisciplinary education with research enabling the student such a student to join the phd program directly bypassing the masters level altogether but suppose a student has done a bachelor's with two majors and wants to go on to do the masters he would only do one year of masters and then be eligible to do the phd a student who has done the three years of bachelor's will have to do a two years of masters so the flexibility of the undergraduate program automatically calls about a flexibility at the masters level and therefore the entry into the phd also would be determined by that but because the student has majors and minors the current rigidity of taking up a phd program where you are fixed to do it only in the discipline that you are only one single discipline that would somewhat dissipate because if the student has done more credits in a discipline even though that student is not majoring in that that student may be allowed to pursue the phd at that level so also at the masters level the flexibility therefore is in the duration combination of courses modes of learning and also the institutions from where he or she is doing since all institutions would take what we envisaged in the nep about nearly 10 years or so to become multidisciplinary institutions this whole change that we are envisaging over a 10 year period in the interim we will allow for the mapping of higher education institution into hei clusters so that this flexibility is not denied to the student so if it is launched in 2022 23 academic year multidisciplinary education will be allowed by students doing it from institutions which are a part of a cluster until and un unless our institutions over a period of time evolve to become pure having all the departments now let me tell here with a pinch of salt it is not possible in a resource starved country for all higher education institutions to offer medicine agriculture law um, uh, pharmacy nursing all of it so the idea of an hei cluster is bound to remain even beyond the 10 years for good some time but because we are allowing the odl and moocs courses to come in we will still be able to translate that multidisciplinary education now in this architecture of the undergraduate program we discontinued with the mphil program and many have asked us why we did that mphil was at one time an essential qualification to get admission to the phd program because the papers on research methodology and the course work related to how you do the research itself was covered within the mphil program it was also an eligibility to become an assistant professor or what we used to call a lecturer today mphil is neither a qualification necessary to become a lecturer or what we call today an assistant professor nor is it an eligibility to do your phd work because all phd programs have got inbuilt coursework on research methodology that has rendered the mphil as a qualification being obsolete no longer serving any purpose 
when a qualification does not serve a purpose and you still continue to offer a two year program of mphil it seems to be a meaningless exercise so again let me clarify it is not from 29 july 2020 the <laughs> regulator whether it is the ugc or whether it is the higher education commission of india will notify that from such and such a date mphil as a course is no longer valid that does not in any way reduce the importance of mphil as a qualification a bulk of us in the teaching fraternity have done mphil as a qualification and it is just that we can add that into our cv that yes we have completed that but the qualification doesn't because the learnings that you have and the fact that you have acquired it should not make you feel that it is a meaningless exercise if currently there are students doing the mphil program and adequate care will be taken that all those who are doing it will be allowed to complete it first they will stop new admissions only then after that they will say those who had to complete it their date will have to be a cut off by such and such a date that you complete the mphil course altogether ma'am uh, this in fact leads to two questions two other questions uh, as a corollary um i think we had discussed in our last uh, uh, webinar also uh, about the school education uh, systems uh the policy talks about a national testing authority and now with this multidisciplinary approach and the cluster approach school level also we talked about cluster approach and the higher education sphere yeah. also we are talking about cluster approach but at the same time even in higher education also if you are today if you look at around i think more number of coaching institutes uh rote memorization i would say the one of the criteria that uh, you know a student is qualified to move to the higher education institution now this is going to be a big challenge because one is parents have to reorient but more than parents i believe the institution higher education institutions because you are bringing uh, students with various backgrounds in uh, different interests and taste and understanding about all these things how are we going to address this challenge of you know this entrance exams and uh, how are we going to address uh, in that context i would also like you to uh, mention about the national testing authority because i i i i, I gather that uh, there could be exam you could attend appear for exams in different times of the year uh, so how are we going to manage uh, this is going to be a mammoth exercise <laughs> when we discuss it we i can initialize it so we need to change a lot yeah so the as i said the nep is not incremental and it is uh, really a very major uh, overhauling of the system uh, we already have a national testing agency the nta and we expect the nta will be the body that would take care of uh, the entire test uh, eligibility test that we need for uh, admissions to the higher levels of courses of course even now we are thinking of the nta doing the iit jee because the it is the current scenario the whole teaching learning process itself uh, will undergo a total transformation because we are not going to have uh, examination systems which will test memory at all we are moving away right from school education and in the school education we have talked about a rationalization of uh, moving away from high stakes board examinations to Uh, multiple levels of exams and multiple uh, opportunities being given and that uh, coaching classes uh, the emphasis on coaching classes would be reduced because the testing would be more on the lines of the scholastic aptitude test rather than the uh, subject based testing that we tend to do and where we are actually testing the student to therefore mem forcibly therefore to memorize uh, it and therefore regurgitate that in the examination papers so when we move away to projects uh, or rather testing which is testing the critical thinking and the application of the knowledge and actually giving them activity based kind of questions which is not picked up directly from the um, reading material or so obviously and the way in which the teaching learning has taken place is also in that manner which means the teachers would have to transform the way we actually transact the curriculum will change new pedagogies come into the picture and therefore the assessment reforms will automatically also undergo changes 
the kind of assessment tools that we use will have to change because you are going in for a new kind of a testing once you are moving away from that then we are thinking firstly if you are actually testing competencies and therefore moving to criteria based assessment where you are testing the competencies of the students then obviously the coaching will have will be redundant because the coaching cannot sit and do customized kind of understanding of the competencies rather the undergraduate programs and even the class 10th and class 12th what we call the secondary stage right from the middle stage onwards assessment reforms will take place in school education where we are thinking that we would have criteria based assessment and competency based assessment and move towards adaptive testing for individual levels of competencies that and all this will no doubt be a major major overhauling and at the moment when we look at it it might seem almost impossible but it is pragmatic and it is doable all that would be required was a lot is a lot of coordinated effort by the examining bodies by the testing agencies by the educational institutions by the stakeholders of the parents the students and the teachers coming together but it will it is possible because once the thought that we have got to change is sort of embedded we it is not something but the question is how long would it take to do that and therefore once we have in school education the national curriculum framework and the national curriculum framework for school education for teacher education and so on and we have the nheqf coming up in the higher education all these would actually strike at the very root of our problem of rote learning memorization and therefore not much of uh, actual learning taking place rather having active learner engagement through a lot of activity based kind of questions and testing on the competency so that even in higher education we want every course to have fixed learning outcomes with learning competencies that would be achieved the competency may be in the cognitive area the competency may be in the application of it the competency may be in a particular skill that the student may acquire so you will actually have a breakdown of the learning process by the multiple levels of activities that the student would have acquired having learned a given course and accordingly the formative assessment including the end of the term assessment will move towards competency based assessment and therefore the kind of testing will move away from the current pre pressures of entrance examinations that we have therefore we would like to see a change in the pressure on the students for going in for this intensive coaching and remove that kind of stress of high stake board examinations and move towards an understanding of the students core competencies through what we call the scholastic aptitude test patterns and so on so a whole lot of reforms using artificial intelligence using technology and allowing the students of course you remember this has happened that when we use technology for many things we have also got to put in the right kind of safeguards so that students do not tend to misuse that there is no doubt about that but the teaching learning processes the kind of assessment tools the pedagogical tools all would go in for a lot of reform and the nta is only the body it is already there in existence we are only increasing the mandate of it and we are only saying that instead of allowing students to have multiple examinations and therefore you know add on to the pressure of examinations on the students let us have some sort of it is not to really say one particular examination alone but that that could be the body that could take care of all examinations that should take place now here there is a risk because when we talk of nta being mandated obviously the state governments would not like this idea of all exams being taken over by the nta therefore the kind of parallel structures that would have to be worked out is something that may have to be actually discussed because when the government of india sits with the state governments this level because this is something that links the school education to the higher education other than of course the entrance examinations it's also the fact that uh, you know when it is multidisciplinary how would you have that kind of testing of multiple intelligences uh, that would take place but the nep 2020 believes that the nta will play a major role starting from school the assessment methods will change 
therefore the kind of assessment that we will have in higher education and at the undergraduate program the all undergraduate uh, multidisciplinary education now until we even move towards that we are going to make it mandatory for internships and apprenticeship the current disconnect between the world of education and the world of work will be dissolved to a great extent by having these internships and let us also be clear that ultimately higher education is either knowledge, knowledge assimilation which is the teaching part or it is the knowledge production which is the research part or the knowledge generation part of it and when we say these are all tools that come into the picture for testing for examinations and so on the whole thing if it is interwoven to understand the holistic purpose of moving students towards effective learning that is the whole core purpose so that they can take up the right kind of jobs adapt themselves with the right kind of skills that they have acquired and multiple knowledges of different subjects and different areas and the whole idea of testing not being an end in itself but being a tool that facilitates all this kind of feedback and assessment of the students for one's own capacities and capabilities is all to be understood in that positive frame of mind currently you have engineers who are trying for clerical jobs is that what they learned engineering for is that what they were that they wasted their time and energy the resources the unit cost that went in from the parents the governmental cost that went in from the institution and the entire exercise of teaching is a mockery if an engineer is finally to become a clerk in a government organization so this whole issue we need to look at it squarely in the face and try and see whether this new reform that we are we are not saying that that this may be the right thing but we think that this may be the right way when we look at it in 2040 then maybe we will see that yes this really worked and if it is not which is also to be accepted we should make the mid course corrections as we go along coming to your point if you remember why the dus if you up was not this thing was you didn't take on board all the stakeholders views in this exercise we are actually doing a lot of consultation to see how we could arrive at a implementation plan of action which is doable with having parallel streams moving for some time you must understand that even when we migrated from the 11 plus 4 to 10 plus 2 plus 3 and now the new four year you have parallel streams it is a common phenomenon so even when we have the new testing that we will have for entrance and so on you will have you know two streams that go along parallelly giving the choice to the student and not putting the student at a disadvantage because of taking any of those choices so this would be the way in which uh, the nep's recommendations on testing evaluation moving away from rote learning and having more relevant uh, education with the right kind of assessment uh, to know the assess the learners knowledge capabilities from competency based assessment and criteria based assess uh now i started getting uh, questions from the uh, participants of this uh, webinar before i go to uh, their questions i have one more uh, i think that is very you know very basic to the nep in higher education uh it's about the reconfiguration of institutions in india uh, because i see uh, when the that voluminous 402 page draft was ready i remember reading through the pages about the 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 significance the importance given to the research and what kind of institutions we require in a country like india those who are really keen and do that academy exercise something like r and d research and development uh, it was envisaged that there should be set of institutions universities which are only for research there are also uh, uh, mentions about uh, those who really want a degree certificate they could do that or for vocational training and other skill training there should be another set of uh, uh, institutions but when the latest policy 2020 policy came i think it all you know summarized into few paragraphs it actually talks about uh, if i read from the policy 
it says that it envisages that every college would develop into either an autonomous degree granting or a constituent college of a university in the latter case it would be a fully part of it it would be a fully a part of the university uh, so uh, could you give some insights on because there are a lot of discussions around it uh, I, I, my understanding is that around 51000 institutions are there in india in the higher education sector around 1000 around 900 universities uh so uh, we are revisiting the all institutional framework in india saying that all institutions are not for men for affiliation i mean colleges giving certificates all institutions are not meant for research but only few institutions so the merit and excellence would matter and those students who really want to get a certificate not like getting into the philosophy of education uh, they don't have to bother about it and the institutions also don't have to bother about it uh so can you give some insights about the reconfiguration that envisage um, envisaged by national education policy yeah so the uh, higher education landscape in our country looks like this about 1000 universities and this uh segment of universities include the institutions of national importance the institutions of eminence when i say institutions of national importance i'm referring to the iits the nits the icers indian institute of science and so on they are all 141 centrally funded institutions of the government of india they are all called as institutions of national importance then you have the institutions of eminence a few of them who got approved and therefore are institutions which had got a huge level of funding the bulk of it is otherwise the uh, and the i am uh, the centrally funded in the 141 also includes the central universities and the bulk of the remaining bulk of it is all the state level institutions these state universities are either run by the government of that particular state or they could be private universities or within the private there could be some deemed universities also now these state universities are largely affiliating universities and therefore one university may have as many as 800 affiliated colleges of course in kerala the uh, universities of kerala or mg university or calicut university or kannur university are not having uh, so many colleges under it they are only having somewhere in the range of about 200 or uh, so unlike that you have colleges in up which have as many as 800 university of pune which has around 800 or so bombay university around 600 to 700 huge uh, number of colleges so looking at this architecture you have thousand universities you have 30000 stand alone institutions what do i mean by stand alone they are offering bed or pharmacy or management or a specialized area only in a given discipline and these are stand alone institutions then you have your 40000 affiliated colleges which as i said under the state universities which are about 800 odd in number these are all affiliated to some state university and so on and there are a few private affiliating universities also this is the architecture or this is the landscape that we are seeing of higher education and as i said being called by multiple names we would firstly like in terms of the nomenclature that all institutions are either called a university or they are called a higher education institution you call yourself a higher education you can mean put in bracket whatever you want to call as your own brand name or whatever but you will not have multiple names being used so that there is an easy understanding of it as far as the reconfiguration of the universities it is not going to be a top down decision it is a decision that the institution will have to do for itself in trying to understand whether it would like to move to become a teaching intensive university or a research intensive university no so this stratification came in for a lot of flack and that is why in the nep 2020 we actually thought instead of doing a clear cut stratification let us have teaching intensive universities research intensive universities and a category of the autonomous grad, the autonomous degree granting colleges now let me clarify when we said the four year undergraduate program these are all undergraduate teaching institutions if they wish to have stop with only that bachelor's degree not offer the masters not offer the phd programs they would be teaching intensive institutions but if the university says we will largely be offering the postgraduate and the doctoral programs but we will have undergraduate teaching in a few disciplines 
it will be a research intensive university with some degree of undergraduate programs so when you are teaching intensive universities you may take up only one research area let us assume that we are a college which is very good at let us say a particular discipline and only in that discipline we would like to have the masters and the phd program then you are a teaching intensive university with some degree of research the research intensive university will be having largely the postgraduate and the doctoral programs with some degree of undergraduate education the idea is that teaching and research should be taking place in both these institutions the quantum of it or the substantive part of it would be less or more and it is not watertight today a teaching intensive university could go on to become a research intensive university also similarly an autonomous degree granting college could tomorrow become a teaching un intensive university also now what is this autonomous degree granting college the 40000 affiliated colleges all of them in 10 years from now or rather 15 years we have said we will phase out affiliation in 15 year period in 15 years are not going to become degree granting colleges all the 40000 there will be rationalization some will perish unless they are willing to become what they acquire certain quality parameters they acquire certain benchmarks and standards of excellence and then go on to become degree granting colleges in a graded manner so there will be hand holding by the host university hand holding by the state government a lot of mentoring that will be happening mentoring by mentor institutions that would be identified and we are bringing out a national mentorship program where there will be mous between institutions for undertaking this mentoring which is a part of the action plan that we are looking at and we are saying that in this 40000 colleges some of them are already autonomous colleges by the ugc those colleges already granted autonomy can easily migrate to become teaching intensive universities and the remaining who are there the few num the few numbers which are autonomous about 800 odd would automatically colleges could go on to become teaching intensive university so your pool of teaching intensive universities is going to increase now the remaining which are there for equity considerations those which are in unserved and underserved areas we will not touch them we will allow them to be converted as what you read from the paragraph to be constituent colleges which is an integral part of a university unlike an affiliating college it is like the delhi university colleges they are not affiliated colleges they are constituent colleges they are part and parcel of the delhi university unlike a college here let us say uh, devra college is affiliated to the mg university it is not a part and parcel of the mg university it is the student passing from devra or rajagiri college is getting a degree certificate given by mg university of which that university is to which university that college is affiliated to so in the period of about 15 years this is the longest Uh, hall of our reform in the period of 15 years we want the 40000 colleges some of them will become a part of the constituent colleges some will become the degree granting colleges and some who are already autonomous and having acquired some benchmark of excellence will move on to become what we call the degree granting autonomous uh, sorry the autonomous colleges will go on to become the teaching intensive universities this kind of rationalization along with a concept of multidisciplinary education and research universities merus is where we are thinking some of our institutions which are already multidisciplinary can move on to become merus that is the idea of having model universities in every district but i have my own reservations because the country these are not new these are not green fields existing ones will have to transform to become merus so you will have some merus across districts but if you say by the number of districts we are around 600 so you can't have 600 merus you will have to have some rationalization you will have some teaching intensive universities you will have research intensive universities and you will have a segment of degree granting autonomous colleges which could also have constituent colleges but all this is determined by the institutional development plan to be made by every higher education institution which is a strategy and vision document 
that every institution can start making even from today without waiting for the nep implementation plan to be rolled out by the government of india or by a state government so ma'am uh, uh, hearing this uh, i have a question to you uh, from uh, this is a question that we received during a registration process uh, this is on uh, why we are not making research as a mandatory uh, provision for the teachers I mean, are we creating two sets of teachers finally I mean, one who is uh, who is into research one set of teachers who are into research the rest are into teaching will it don't you don't you think that it will affect the quality of education especially the higher education we are talk, referring to Uh, so the opinion? faculty eligibility as of today requires that people who are qualified with phd qualifications only come into teaching we have a problem of not having the number of vacancies being filled in and for that we would like to identify early talent phd scholars will be given teaching assistantships and therefore they would be encouraged to take up teaching as a career but to say that all teachers would be researchers is not a solution to that because someone could be very good at undergraduate teaching but not be able to guide research projects because of the kind of exposure to research that the teacher himself and that would happen largely for the senior teachers many of them who have on a time scale moved on to become a professor but uh, while even now the ugc norms do not allow going beyond a reader if you don't have a phd to become that the current eligibility has everyone who is phd qualified becoming coming into the teaching fraternity so the the, the the faculty is already having an exposure to research the question that is coming into the mind is what kind of research because a lot of scathing remarks into our research um, uh, qualifications or the phd qualifications are being raised because it is just for the sake of getting a doctoral degree that you have a lot of phd's uh, being churned out and the very number if somebody is guiding as many as 20 phd scholars at a given point of time you can easily make out what would be the quality of that uh, phd student so many many uh, universities have come in for scathing attack uh, on this aspect of uh, um, you know the kind of phd but the nep 2020 i do not know why this uh, misapprehension we have in created two verticals by saying that an institution would be teaching intensive or an institution is research intensive there is nothing that precludes the faculty in that particular institution not to pursue in fact the entire chapter on uh, chapter 13 and sections of chapter 15 has said that we should encourage faculty to take up innovative research projects and they would be incentivized if they take up research projects in fact even the promotions we say that we will fast track such faculty who contribute to the body of research whether it is in uh, pedagogical tools whether it is in development of e content or whatever but nowhere in the policy we have sought to uh, 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 desist faculty from going in for research and because there is a clarific there is a classification of teaching intensive and research it doesn't mean those faculty will only do teaching they are not going to do research at all or those who are research intensive will not do undergraduate teaching in fact we are saying that higher education faculty will even go on for secondary school teaching because they should be able to bring about a bridging the gap between the secondary stage of education and the higher education stage we want undergraduate students all to have research have uh, internship projects all of them to take up apprenticeship so obviously there will be some degree of research exposure even for faculty in teaching intensive institutions and the policy encourages faculty to go in for uh, research they will be incentivized they will get fast track promotions also uh, ma'am there is another set of questions regarding funding uh uh this is regarding uh my reading is uh, around 73 to 74% 70, 70 around 70% of our higher education institutions are in private sector and and the another study that i read was uh, regarding 
how much funding is there for this privately owned education institutions and here percent in one of the surveys they said that we are not receiving any funds and i am so happy that hnp is going to treat them both public and private equally and uh, giving going to planning to give them some funds but now with the i think this question comes especially uh, you know on 1st of february we are expecting union budget and a lot of discussion has happening and i think last couple of days before uh, i i see some newspaper reports that uh, government is planning to roll out nep and uh, there are there is a lot of expectation on uh, you know budget uh, about uh, the the how much money we are going to allocate for higher education or even the in the uh, implementation of uh, national education policy so uh, how are we how what is the plan i mean how are we going to ensure that even somebody has uh, mentioned that even 6% of gdp might not be enough to meet the goals as <laughs> seeing the goals and objectives set for nep and i know that this is like 15 uh, years plan we have but uh, 6% if we, if we are not spending 6% now and even the even if we spend 6% uh, they say that uh, it may not be sufficient uh, could you give some insights on this uh, uh, argument the and on the argument <laughs> the, the 6% gdp dr dhanuraj has been said in the 1968 policy yes and we are nowhere near that mark we are still standing at something 0.44 4.43 uh, of the uh, entire budgeted uh, the gross domestic product the gdp we are only spending that much now when we were writing the policy and particularly the chairman was of the view that we are projecting india as a 5 trillion economy and so on and that uh, fund should not be a problem and if co- that was before covid had uh, struck us as a pandemic but the fact remains that uh, right from my planning commission days uh, uh, you see the planning commission used to do the budgetary allocations for the state governments Uh, and uh, uh, the subject of education remains a matter in the concurrent list and there are government of india schemes where 100% funding comes from the government of india there are centrally sponsored schemes where center state come on a sharing basis uh, for example the sarva shiksha abhiyan before it was rationalized into the rte is a state and share center sharing of 70 to 30 rusa is also a centrally sponsored scheme in higher education nevertheless having said about what the ground realities are the funding part of it nep let me clarify is not going to fund private institutions the policy nowhere said that public funding or tax payers money would go to fund private institutions we say that they are governed by the same set of norms and standards meaning that the same yardstick would be used and rather we have said that private institutions through differential fee structuring or whatever will ensure that by cross subsidization offer additional scholarships for those who are coming from the socially and economically disadvantaged groups on the other side we have said that the funding ha- actually the draft nep said that the 20% of the budgeted expenditure could be set aside for education but we dropped that because there are some state governments which came up saying that we are already going beyond that so we said that okay let us not enter into a controversy of how much percentage of the budgeted expenditure though that is more realizable as a goal we will keep it as 6% of the gdp which is not trying to rock the boat since it has been a long pending recommendation however the kind of corporate investment where is our high, where is any of our educated person going to is going to the industry and the kind we have a report of narayana murthy known as the corporate sector participation in higher education commonly referred to as a narayana murthy report on uh, pub, uh, private sector funding where we have said that the greatest beneficiary of the education system is the corporate sector and the kind of corporate sector funding that needs to come in whether it could be in ppp mode whether it could be in outsourcing of certain activities is with pandemic when we talked about the digital divide and the lack of access to digital devices and the digital infrastructure of our higher education institutions and the schools we could not find corporate houses and industry houses coming forward to fill that gap now higher education financing agency hefa 
has been created as a sovereign body which can take loans from government of india standing as the sovereign guarantor and higher education on of course a repayable period after a moratorium of uh, a, a substantially long period but that is one way for the infrastructure funding that is being thought about we are talking in terms of philanthropy both alumni funding both innovative ways of internal revenue generation one of the aspects that came up during up my planning commission days was that the irgs of higher education institutions is abysmally low there are many ways set up industry chairs set up incubation labs set up some sort of interactive mechanisms by which you are using that resources for maybe sports infrastructure and so on so many ways and since in this nep we are talking about setting up of so many activity clubs and so on these are the areas where we would like to see a lot of corporate sector funding or philanthropy funding or alumni funding let us be fair we benefited from that education system we are today in a position to give it back but unfortunately that spirit is just not there and to believe that everything will come from government and from the taxpayer is something that is not tenable for a very long period it cannot sustain itself however even for this coming budget when you see the budget lines you might not see much except for the incremental increase that is there because we are prepared to move on in the very coming an annual budget to actually see an nep being translated but every institution will have to think in terms of undergoing and when we did the implementation plan we are saying the non financial and the financial so the financial part will take time because there has got to be a lot of preparatory work that goes into it the training and all that those are ongoing things that is business as usual you just need to prep it up a little bit so on the funding part of it there is something where and in fact even for the nep implementation let us not say that there is a third party that is going to implement it it is each one of us whether it is an institution whether it is a faculty whether it is a student the same way even for the funding some part of it will come no doubt it is a social welfare activity education is seen as a public good we want that we should be able to take care of the educational needs of the disadvantaged groups we address the infrastructure gap we want all this to be done the technological um, uh, infrastructure to be created that and the nep action plans are already having work in progress we are hoping that on an incremental year to year basis you will not have it for because we are not in a period where we are doing it five year planning or something like that so you won't see a chunk or a big bulk amount that may be coming in but on a really incremental manner you will see that depending upon the reforms that are going on so nrf nrf is already created it is sitting within the office of the principal scientific advisor to the prime minister which is today extremely busy with the covid vaccine development and so on but the nrf is already there and the nr along with the science technology and innovation policy which is in the making has talked in terms of instrumentation labs being created in hei so funding may come from the ministry of education but so when you look at the government it is government with various departments and funding may come through different sources the same way when we and i still remember one of the states which came to us in the planning commission used to fund the mid day meal scheme through the funds of the local self government the way you look at the funding source you see for a state government roads power projects drinking water sanitary priorities social sector like health and education may be only for states like kerala and some other states where public good is public welfare is seen very prominent but lesser developed states may actually find that on that so it's quite complex there is no one size fits all but overall policy feels that india can generate the resources and if our economy can grow then that 6% of gdp will be a substantial part because it depends upon the size of the corpus itself when we talk about what is the economy size that the 6% would be making a impact that that number if we reach 6% i would be happy about
<laughs> I, I understand. As a public policy research, a researcher, I think I've been uh, uh, debating this six percent both in health and education for like last many years. I mean, probably more than a decade. So I completely understand the challenges that government is having now. Um, uh, moving uh, to the next question, uh, there is a question on. Uh, this is regarding the language issue. I mean, uh, we discuss language. in school education webinar also but in the higher education uh, policy part it is mentioned that they could even learn in the local language as well i mean uh, ma'am could you clarify and the question here is now by doing that by encouraging that uh, are we uh, creating different classes uh, among the students those who speak fluent english and probably they can access the global job market and there are those who are learning in local language uh, they may not be able to access so that's that's a, that's a concern that i could see in that question uh, so could you clarify on that so the recommendation of uh, one is of course the idea of multilingualism which is very much there in school teach a gr target of 50% in the draft nep we had said 2030 the um, uh, the idea of reaching a ger target by of 50% by 2035 which is related to the school education target of ensuring universal retention of all students between the ages of 3 to 18 by 2030 in higher education one of the factors preventing students is the medium of instruction on one side people like us who speak fluent english believe that knowing equal to becoming a knowledgeable person which is of course highly fallacious my malayalam may be bad and therefore if i can communicate only in malayalam does not mean i am not a knowledgeable person english is not meaning that you are intelligent english is only a communication medium of language we thought that the socially and economically disadvantaged groups and those who are coming from an agrarian background who do, who do not come into higher education because of english being a medium of instruction if we allow for undergraduate programs to be offered regional languages and therefore the 22 languages in the eighth schedule of the Hello. if there are pockets where tamil is being spoken a lot it could be even in tamil provided you have teachers so the faculty will have to be able to one the re, uh, the textual material the reading material should be bilingual the faculty should be capable of actually be able to teach bilingually if not having that skill like someone like me then they will have to have some in higher education having uh, the, the move from english medium education is only a way of trying to say that for an agrarian economy with Uh, a large number of students desisting to come into higher education because of the diffidence of not knowing the english language and because they don't know english language and they would only be doing rote learning without understanding what it is they just memorize it and do it uh, mechanically and then give an examination and get a piece of paper that they call it we have actually seen that offering it in regional languages might actually be beneficial for a country like india and our colonial hangover that while it is a colonial hangover there is no doubt about that it is also a fact that english is an international link language we are not saying that you don't teach them english as part of the 21st century scheme you can have spoken english being taught you can have english classes being taught but offer higher education even in other languages other than english provided you can have the teachers you can have the textual material you create the kind of e content because we are talking of odl systems so all state open universities offer it in their own language kerala also recently had i think on the uh, uh, literacy day that we have the uh, sri narayana gurun kerala state open university so uh, yashwantrao chahan maharashtra open university offers it in marathi all state open universities offer it in their own regional languages that does not mean that those students who have completed it in their regional languages are less uh, intelligent qualified than those who came out 
uh, with the english medium in fact my own personal experience when i used to evaluate papers for the bombay university was that when we were given you know those blanked out answers for centralized evaluation i could easily sense a student from a vernacular medium who is making a herculean effort in conveying that content as against a south bombay college where the content is hardly 10% but the flow of presentation was so awesome and therefore as a teacher i was trying to make a considered view in advantage visa via south college south mumbai college student whose content was merely because the student had studied from test papers had the bulleted points had the connectivity to use that language to connect those points but had not really contributed much to that particular question so let us be very very realistic on ground merely because india as a country used english for a substantially long time we have a huge literature a huge language diversity that is there let countries in the world come to know about the indian languages create a pool of young graduates who can speak on those languages but not to say that we will preclude them from not learning english let them also be empowered with the english language and that is something that they would acquire because they would have that freedom to be able to complete a day program but gradually would also have the ability to learn the english language through the competencies that we try to develop in our multidisciplinary education uh ma'am we have with us uh, uh the philomena p george uh, director of academics acms college kochi uh, ma'am philomena ma'am uh, are you are you there could you ask that question could you ask that question directly to the uh, resource person here hello yes uh, yes my question is cdnba all these people are there i think i think there is a connectivity problem and the accreditations and uh, one lead is you don't credit go for uh, for uh, equivalence etc now it will be the transition like we are now as of now accredited with this change when will it come through when the national accreditation council will be own and the accreditation you know like uh, the body accredited by the national accrediting body and then we have to apply what is that we are in a dilemma now we are not clear what is the timeline like uh, dr dr could you yeah, get yeah, I, yeah i will i will i will i will read out the question for her uh, what will happen to institutions um, uh, like Uh, the institutions uh, uh, institutions like uh, acm uh, the business schools offering pg dbm mba pg dm and mba which are accredited by national board of accreditation as of now up to june 2021 and are they going to be accredited by the national accreditation council for further periods that's a question what is the timeline for this change uh, that's the question she is asking am i audible now Yes, ma'am. Yes. Did you hear my question? NBA as a body, the NBA as a body remains in existence as long as the new Higher Education Commission of India bill does not become an act. I don't envisage that bill coming up in the budget session, which is a very short budget session, becoming an act unless we really fast track it. If the HCI actually becomes an act in this budget. then only the question of the new bodies coming into existence by june becomes a reality yeah so what i was trying to say and am i audible now dhanuraj yes ma'am yes ma'am go ahead yeah so uh, what i am trying to say is unless the higher education commission of india act gets passed it is unlikely that the nbas powers will cease to exist in june 2021 it is very very unlikely in this coming 5 months that the new architecture will come into existence so colleges like scms or any of those single discipline institutions will have to continue to pursue it with nba until and until there is a notification that nba no longer exists and the higher education commission of india comes into existence but what i would urge private institutions 
I, what I would urge private institutions to follow is that institutions which are single discipline can start thinking in them in terms of actually becoming a part of a higher education cluster or trying to set up new departments to move towards the new multidisciplinary education. So I think uh, it is important that institutions such as SEMS will start looking at creating an institutional development plan to start becoming multidisciplinary institutions. But NBA will continue. I don't see that it goes away by June 2021. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Philomena, ma'am, uh, for asking the question. Uh, since uh, ma'am mentioned about uh, development plans, what are the preparatory works that uh, one institution could uh, think of as of now, you know, so that they could lead to that larger vision as envisaged by national education policy? Could you give some insights, ma'am, on that, uh, the development plan, the institutional development plan I'm referring to? IDP. Hello? Autonomous bodies. And uh, uh, you, many of the things may come in through rules and regulations that are brought out by regulatory uh, um, uh, structures. But to bring about, uh, to make an assessment of the infrastructural facilities, uh, the human resources that we have, and where we would like to see our uh, higher education uh, moving to becoming a teaching intensive institution or a research intensive institution, or if it's an affiliated college, every HEI must now think in terms of task force, which higher management, all of them together, preparing what we call a vision document or a strategic plan of action, which could be for three years, where an assessment of the infrastructure, assessment of the learning resources, assessment of the human resources are taken into account and you work out an action plan in the reforms that have to take in the uh, teaching learning methodologies, in the teacher training capacity, and particularly for the teacher training capacity and to be ramped up or addressed this is something that we would like all HEIs to start working upon. EP or the Institutional Development Plan will help HEIs to make considered choices on where they would like to see that institution going forward. So that, say, for example, since SCA and Dr. Philomena had asked this question, SCMS can create an institutional development plan. We are offering only management, multidisciplinary. Can we create more departments? Can we open up more departments? Or can we become a part of a cluster? The kind of faculty resources, the learning resources, the uh, infrastructure resources, if we have to open new classes. Therefore, you will actually use faculty strength, industry associations, industry bodies itself, civil society coming together to create this action plan where you are looking at a vision plan for every HEI and which will be unique to that institution. But which can then say, okay, uh, uh, let us say, for example, if uh, IIT is making an action plan or an IDP, it might say within two years we are going to implement yeah. So uh, the only thing is, only idea is that IDPs are going to be the key instrument which an institution prepares with its own faculty and students and deans and directors and industry association and so on to see where they would like to see that institution going forward. Idea of an IDP. And I don't think you need to wait for any UGC notification or Ministry of Education or any state government uh, rules and regulations. You can already work on it. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So uh, there is a question on National Research Fund, ma'am. Uh, so if you could explain the, the idea yeah. of uh, so creation of this fund. NRF on NRF. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
so on the nrf um, as i said it is already created it is already uh, in the announced in the last budget uh, even though the policy was not uh, of uh, corpus fund of an initial amount seeding amount was created what is the nrf many thought that you know my research project is going to be dictated by nrf not at all nrf is an umbrella architecture to catalyze interdisciplinary multidisciplinary research nurture research in state universities and bring a platform of higher education institutions along with research lab the csr icmr icar and the industry coming together so that you put a ecosystem for developing patents for promoting startups for developing entrepreneurial skills and allow for research in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary areas it is not going to enter into the micro management of research topics that are being undertaken by students in their doctoral studies in different state universities it that is nowhere being contemplated at all it is only a body that will have enhanced funding along with dst funding dbt funding icssr funding all those funding will continue but we will have greater funds coming to nrf over a period of time because right now that is being where the covid vaccine is the challenge at the moment but nrf over the nrf to be in the ministry of education but if it was in the ministry of education the thrust on research may have been limited that scientific advisor to the prime minister because it can collate research taking place across government departments state universities central universities iits research laboratories and so on bringing them together in an amalgamation for promoting cutting edge research and nurturing research at the undergraduate education level uh, so there is another question uh, uh, this is regarding who decides the curriculum and how will they be selected this is especially in the context of affiliated college the ambition uh, is uh, you know what we ambition in the uh, national education policy is that affiliated colleges will become also become autonomous colleges and all and i think this question is very pertinent because in kerala we have given autonomy to many uh, colleges and uh, but when we studied the autonomy we realized that there is no administrative autonomy in most of the cases there is no financial autonomy this is different from nep what nep i mean envisions so uh, uh, from starting from the curriculum you know in uh, kerala as far as my understanding goes around 25 to 30% curriculum could be uh, changed but still they require university's approval and all so in this context i think the question from this participant is very relevant who decides the curriculum and how will they be selected what about the autonomy and freedom in that process so uh, the uh, let, let us also understand when we say the nep recommendation for bringing about changes in the curriculum currently the existing rules and regulations are valid as i said even for uh, the case of scms current rules and regulations give only autonomous colleges the freedom to make their own curricula now if you say for example the kerala landscape that they don't have the administrative autonomy and they don't have the financial always it is the first stage of academic autonomy moving on to the next stage of allowing the conduct of examination within the broad in the nep what we visualize is within the broad framework of the national higher education we can have the curricula being designed by the autonomous degree granting college until an affiliated college is a part of the university it has no role in framing that curricula at all but if it is an autonomous college then it can do it within that broad framework let me give you an example if you are talking of let us say uh, life sciences and as a discipline today the ambit of life sciences globally would have had a lot of developments and it would include many other things which traditionally when we studied life sciences where it may not have included 
Now, as an institution, seeing the depth of that discipline in the global knowledge that area that we have, a university or a college can include those new topics into the curricula when framing the curricula. All that we will have is a broad framework saying that take in new developments, take in new research areas. This is will be what that nomenclature will read like. Now it is left to the faculty in that institution or the board of studies that we normally call to decide on that curriculum framework that they would like to use in that autonomous college. But curriculum development currently is only given to those colleges which are autonomous colleges, affiliated colleges do not enjoy that freedom. In the NEP 2020, once we have the National Higher Education Qualifications Framework and the General Education Council or the professional standard setting bodies, once they lay down a broad framework aligned to the NHEQF, where you can have vocational subjects, you can include that as part of it. You can, as an institution, make the curricular changes within this ambit. Not They will not micromanage it. The micromanagement can be done by that autonomous institution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Jerin Varghese. He's asking about you know, how this reforms in uh, school education level are connected to link to how how are we streamlining uh, the reforms that we discussed probably in the last webinar uh, and the, the the reforms that we are discussing in higher education he's asking how will the breaking of the division of arts commerce and science streams in higher school benefit higher education because in school education also we talked a lot of reforms and how this is going to benefit higher education so uh, the policy talks about the interconnectedness between the different levels of education and seeing it as one continuum. Now, we need not think that the implementation will go like this. In the school education, we are having three new curricular frameworks. National Curriculum Framework for Early Childhood Care and Education, the Curricular and Pedagogical Framework, National Curriculum Framework for School Education, National Curriculum Framework for Teacher Education. Yeah, and the fourth one is the National Curriculum Framework for Adult Education. In higher education, we don't have a new curriculum framework. We have a National Higher Education Qualifications Framework and an Academic Bank of Credit. This is work in parallel. So one need not wait to see the new architecture of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 to go into the multidisciplinary education. While school education will launch that, maybe let us say in two years from now, higher education also, once the NHEQF and the ABC is ready, we will be able to launch the four-year program. But the disconnect between the secondary stage and the higher education, that is being bridged right from middle stage onwards, where we are doing away with the curricular rigidities and allowing students to take up in combination of courses. And it could be vocational, it could be arts, it could be science, any combination. So your pattern of 10th and 12th exams will also undergo changes, which will be a parallel activity as much as we move into the multidisciplinary education. So the policy is very, very conscious. And in fact, uh, the document is still not public. The uh, Education Quality Upgradation uh, uh, and Improvement Program, EQUIP, that is the implementation plan for higher education, where we have said that, the, uh, we have specifically said that school and higher education, we need to bring about a connect and ensure that student induction programs are started. We start career counseling to move into that. Higher education faculty go to teach in secondary schools create a mentoring, mentoring uh, mentee association between higher education institutions and schools so that you create a network there. So there is, the policy is looking at bridging this present, uh, what I may say, watertight compartment of school versus, uh, as against higher being bridged together 
through a number of interventions and the parallel activities of implementing school and higher we need not wait to see the new curriculum uh, curricular structure of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 that will take 20 that will almost go up to 2035 we are not waiting to say that he will start after that no way we will be also starting once the nheqf and the academic bank of credit comes into existence thank you ma'am uh, i think we are coming to the end of the program uh, i'll take two more questions one is from sri kumar raghavan he is asking uh, what will happen to the present employees of ugc and uh, aact uh, when we form the new higher education commission uh, uh, you have any insights ma'am about that i know no no so that's always a part of the transition uh, thing when they uh, uh, usually should be uh, absorbed within the new Right. Uh, structures right. you can't throw out <laughs> you can't throw out they are human beings and uh, you cannot create a structure and then say that the people who are part of that structure we are only talking about a remodeling of the structure it is nothing to do with the people that go to compose that uh, uh, that organization right ma'am i think uh, your connectivity is better so could you switch on video so that okay. we can take the last question okay. yeah yeah sure sure yeah. So uh, this is a question from my young colleague uh, Agansha. Agansha, are you there? Could you ask? Uh, could you come on video and ask this question? It's very interesting question. So I would like you to ask question directly to ma'am. Agansha. Yes. Uh, so basically, the policy talks about phasing out single stream uh, higher education institutions and replacing those with uh, multidisciplinary institutions. because uh, mainly to address the issue of fragmentation of education in india as the policy talks about it but uh, as we know india is a very large and diverse country so the presence of you know thousands of colleges has always ensured a very easy access to education to everybody especially students in rural areas so my question was would the setting up of multidisciplinary institutions would it lead to a lot of homo homogenization and uh, centralization of education and uh, if that's the case how can we ensure uh, inclusion and access to all the students uh, especially the ones living in uh, rural areas and the ones who do not have easy access to education with the setting up of these multidisciplinary institution so that was my question uh thanks akansha i think uh, for a young scholar that makes a lot of uh, sense uh, to ask that question and concern is really really valid i think i um, it must have overlooked many of you when i said that this entire restructuring uh, has a caveat and that is on the aspect of equity and inclusion and ensuring that access in unserved and underserved areas uh, to higher education will not be uh, uh, sort of uh, put at risk so that we keep you can't reach a ge you can't be self contradictory you can't say you want to reach a ge target of 30 per, 30 uh, 50% by 2035 you can't say that sdg 4 of ensuring uh, inclusive and quality equitable education for all and promoting lifelong opportunities is something we commit ourselves to and then say that no we will not give you colleges in that part of the world at all the idea of having single discipline universities becoming multidisciplinary whether they are colleges which can be a part of a, a, a cluster should not in any way preclude the educational access of those who are living in geographically inaccessible parts of the country but at the same time how the the dates at which each state and each area within a state also intra also within a state how fast they can move towards that is something where we have given good 15 years we have said by 2035 the only stand alone institutions which will be shut down in 2030 are the bed stand alone colleges all bed 
standalone institutions which is a money making machine creating substandard teachers not worth the salt to be called a teacher will have to move towards offering four year integrated bac bed or ba bed programs or become part of multidisciplinary education now when making a reform if we had not talked about the aspect of ensuring the educational participation of the scdgs we cannot continue with an affiliation system which is creating a huge number of unemployed graduates the only satisfaction we are having is in terms of our statistics we can say that so and so is a graduate but that piece of paper is as good as just a chalan that you cut in any shop if that cannot get you a relevant job and that is not making you the it is underemploying you then that degree is not worth it and that is not what india wants to have as having the largest youth population so equity considerations quality aspects the requirements of global changes that are happening all this need to be looked at in a combination but since our preparedness in this country which is so diverse so what maybe tripura might take about 12 years you might find maharashtra or you might find any other state maybe doing it in another 5 years so across the states the ability or the preparedness to achieve that will have to be factored in but nowhere in this policy in fact this policy's principles the cardinal principles if you read through those 22 cardinal principles talks of strengthening the public education system and ensuring that equity and inclusion would be there and correcting any imbalances that would be there but that should not be a reason for continuing with an affiliation system which has outlived its purpose and affiliation is not the one which is provided enough riders to ensure that there would not be centralization we have agreed to the fact that education is a matter in the concurrent list and i don't think any other consultative process has taken that on board as much as this nep formulation has taken that on board yes we will have a lot of teething problems we will have a lot of concerns as we go down the way this is bound to be your any implementation but i think if there is concerted effort by the state governments coming together with the government of india and the higher education institutions as well as the social welfare organizations dealing with the educational needs of these segments of the society and we are conscious you see when the government of india niti ayog gives you a list of about i think it's about 168 aspirational districts we have clearly said in chapter 6 and in chapter 14 that the colleges and schools in these aspirational districts will be emboldened and strengthened to ensure that public education is made available to people living in these aspirational districts aspirational districts are those districts which are either geographically inaccessible or dominated by sc population or st population or nexalite affected or having a huge turbulent area and therefore needs special interventions and we have even said we will set up special education zones and create social inclusion funds and gender inclusion funds to address these kind of social and economic imbalances in educational participation of the scd thank you uh, uh, i think agasha represents the aspirational generation of this country uh, so that's also the reason that i thought of conclude with her question and uh, uh, i realized that you know after uh, moderating these two sessions there were on about school education and the one this about uh, higher education it's a it's a long way to go we have so many challenges but the vision is clear you know we as a aspirational young population what the state should offer and how state should drive them uh, to the future uh, goals that is set by the country as a nation i think nep reflects the mood of the country i think nep also looks at various possibilities 
that probably so far we have not explored. And NEP also explores as an economic, you know, I think last last time also we discussed, you know, the, the policy starts with you know, India as an economic growth power. Uh, so uh, I'm sure, you know, like uh, I remember this uh, you know, famous poem by Robert Frost, you know, boots are, boots are lovely, dark and deep, but miles to go. I'm sure we have miles to go, but uh, with a, you know, uh, positive uh, uh, energy and also with a positive outlook on what India could achieve. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your time. I'm sure we will continue this dialogue. Uh, we are not going to stop with these two <laughs> webinars. Uh, yeah. I think this is a continuous process as a public policy institution. I think it's our responsibility also to uh, debate and discuss and also to engage government if we could help them in uh, implementing some of these policy provisions. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and uh, hand over to Missy to conclude the session. Um, thank you, Dr. Bandaraj. Thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, Shamshun, ma'am, for the willingness to share your expertise. Uh, we had a very insightful session. Um, I would also like to thank all the participants who uh, who stayed through uh, the webinar. Uh, uh, I hope you all enjoyed the session just as much. So um, you can access the recorded session on our YouTube channel and Facebook. Um, so please feel free to share the uh, the link to your interested colleagues and friends. Uh, we will continue uh, the education dialogue series. So uh, we will meet you next time. Thanks again for your participation. <laughs>